Well, welcome to our third Longview Conversation with podcast. Uh, there's a lot to talk about, and today we're going to start digging into the really big question of what might break. I mean, clearly the Fed has been pretty hard at it. I mean, we heard from Jerome Powell last night, loosening up the pace of rate hikes, but still hiking, still doing quantitative tightening, still one of the most aggressive rate hiking periods from the Fed and other central bankers. So that leads us to ask the question, what might break? A lot of people in markets are of the view that the Fed tightens until something breaks. And what that is, well, let's dig into that in a minute. But some talk about the Japanese banking system. There's been a lot of chat about crypto. And of course, um, other, other topics, including the Chinese banking system that we're going to get onto today. Uh, added to that, Ted spreads a why. There's some stress somewhere in the system. And there's a lot of evidence and chat about dollar shortages in Europe. So it looks like something's set to break. Working out where is kind of the big thing and the big question. Um, but here to discuss all these matters, our next guest on the show. I'm absolutely thrilled to have Andrew Hunt with me from Andrew Hunt Economics. Welcome, Andrew. Thank you. Thank, thank you for having me. Absolute pleasure. Really brilliant to have you on, on the show. Sounds very glamorous calling a show, but why not? Uh, on the podcast. Um, now, you're, 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 you have a sort of eminent track record of calling lots of fantastic uh, crises events over the last 20, 30 plus years, I guess. Uh, you've got a long history of working in the city and in, uh, in environments like that. I wonder if you could give us a brief summary of, of where you've been, what you've been up to, and, and then later on we'll dig into how you go about thinking about the world. Okay, I, I think I became known as a bit of the angel of death at one point in that I, I started my career um, working in the city of London just after the Big Bang. Uh, so I was there for the Lawson boom and bust and uh, working for a small company called Thornton that was taken over by Dresdner Bank. Um, and I had a happy 13 years at Dresdner. They were incredibly supportive of my research efforts. Uh, it was a great place to work. But by... I don't know, coincidence or otherwise, they started me in London as the Lawson boom went bust in 89, 90, and of course the RM crisis. From there, they moved me to Tokyo for the end of the Japanese bubble. Then I was in Asia for the, the boom and bust up to the Asian financial crisis. Uh, and then and they decided that I should spend lots of time in California um, at the end of the 90s, just so I could get the tech bust as well. So right. uh, I, I had, <laughs> you had a, a front row seat. For many I, uh, of these events. Yeah, I uh, I sort of had the credit booms and the and the bus for about thirteen years. I was sort of by design or otherwise seemed to be in the centre of that. So I had a great thirteen years at, at Dresdner, but all good things come to an end. Um, corporate mergers and the like. I decided to found Andrew Hunt Economics in two thousand and one. Um, really designed to service the big macro hedge funds that were you know, in a sense dominant at that time and they, they were great clients but time moves on uh, today the company is some more mainstream portfolio managers a lot of family offices and a lot of banks uh, yeah. in, in the treasury departments and and the like so I now find I'm writing about my clients which is an interesting position to be in well, as long as you're being positive, it's not so hard. But I guess, yeah, it can be challenging at times, I would imagine. Yeah. But that's a fantastic career. And, 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 a, and as I said, a front row seat to many of the boom and bust, which is probably, I guess, in a sense, influenced uh, a lot of the kind of work you're doing. Would that Definitely. Be a comment? Yeah, I, I suppose I sell the service as a landmine avoidance. Um, right. If it was <laughs> from the US mortgage us to we generally try to be a little bit in front of these things and to warn even bottom-up portfolio managers that you may have the best stocks on the planet um but you can still get whacked by something coming from left field and that and that's for certainly for the asset management clients that that's a service i try to provide that's interesting so um so and and, and if i remember rightly we we first met i think in in hong kong at a conference. we did yeah, a CIO conference, I think. Wasn't a, great, it? a great CIO conference, although I seem to remember the personal trainer getting us doing all sorts of odd things in the lunch break. <laughs> oh, I think I avoided that. It was uh, it was the wonderful AJ Kapoor, I think. It was. Maybe. No, it was, it was a great, it was a good fun couple of days. And it was back, back, Bank of America Merrill Lynch, wasn't it? Who, I who think so. In, um, yeah. In the Grand Hyatt, I think, overlooking the harbour. Yeah, 
Yeah, it was fantastic. I remember that it was a great, a great event. I think even then we were talking a lot about China back probably ten years ago or or eight years ago or whatever it was. But um, but uh, but but it's interesting. So it's great to have you on. We of course, in a sense, we're competitors, but in 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 all good in all good um, sense of how industries work, you've got to talk to people you compete with. It's, they're the most interesting people to talk to. I always think. Got to keep you honest, and a bit of friendly competition is good. Plus a bit of banter. A bit of banter, indeed. <laughs> so, and just so I, so your and your course coming from you're in Guernsey today, I believe. I am. I, I, I'm, I'm on out. a speck of granite in the in the Bay of St. Malo. Absolutely glorious and sunshine. Beautiful sunshine, no frost, no fog. Uh, it's a great day here, actually. I won't rub that in too much for anybody <laughs> in the UK. Well, that's the benefit of being that bit closer to France, I think, isn't it? Um, but uh, wonderful. So, okay, so so little sort of teaser icebreaker questions I like to throw in there um, uh, before we get into the, the the meat of how you go about thinking about life. Um, but I've got to ask you, who 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 would you regard as the best central banker you've come across in your career, or or observed, or um, ha- have listened to regularly? Who 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 would you say is the best operator? Um, I think in the early days it would have been Carl Otto Pearl at the at the Bundesbank, great for avoiding moral hazard, kept everybody on their toes and had a pretty enviable record in, in controlling inflation. Yes, I have he the greatest the with, he's the famous man with the toothpaste comment, is he, about inflation? Yeah, yeah. he is. Yeah. Um and Teetmeyer that came after him, I was always quite impressed with. I have the greatest um, professional and actually personal respect for Shirakawa-san. Um, given the hand he was dealt at the Bank of Japan, I think he did exceptionally well. And, he, and he's a super chap and a fascinating person to talk to, um, particularly if you persuade him to come out for afternoon tea. He, he's a fountain of information. Fantastic, um, yeah. More recently, I'd actually go with my old friend, John McDermott. Um, unfortunately, overlooked as the governor of the Reserve Bank of New Zealand, but I think he would have steered that country through the pandemic and the inflation that, that followed. Um, probably very, he's a very measured, very thoughtful and a superb modeler. And, a good, and again, a good guy, um, good guy. no ego, yeah. which um, I think is an advantage in that job. So I'm hoping one day John, John gets his um, lifetime ambition there. Right. Well, that's interesting. And any common traits you'd say say between them all, all those all those names you mentioned? Married to the job. Married to the job. <laughs> it's not an ego. It, it, it maybe it's a calling, but um, yeah, yeah, it's a sense of national service before self publicity. Yes, calling is 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 is, is a sense of the right term, isn't it? Yeah, your service. It's a service, not just. Uh, not just getting on and and uh, and we could think of one or two central bankers I think that we might describe as having that uh, ego issue uh, more about themselves perhaps than about the the serving. But I, I can think of a few. I, actually, yeah. and to be fair, I did like the second version of Mervyn King. wasn't quite so keen on the first version. Okay, okay. I'm not sure exactly what you mean by that. But um, <laughs> after after central banking. Um, yeah, some really insightful comments, but perhaps didn't fight his corner hard enough while he was actually in situ. Yes, overwhelmed by the politics, perhaps. Um, okay, brilliant. That's really interesting. So that and and so let's get into let's get into how you think about life. Can you? And then we'll get into the views. I think it's important that we explain to people how you go about getting to your conclusions, and then the conclusions often make more sense when when we get to the views. And so on. So, so can you give us an overview of, of your approach? Would you say you're a monetarist, you're a Keynesian, you're uh, Austrian, you're none of the above? You're... Uh, it, it's how, how would you describe it, it, it? It's an eclectic, I suppose people would say, with a monetary leaning. The, the, the bottom line is I think every entity, be it a person, a company, um, an investor, has an optimal balance sheet. Um, They may not think about it in an exact sense, but they have some distribution of their assets and liabilities that they'd like to achieve. We're rarely there and shocks occur that mean we're not where we want to be. Um, And the effort of moving from where we are to where we would like to be involves generating flows. 
whether that's a flow of money into retail spending or into equities or into another currency. Um, but those flows have implications for financial asset prices, for currencies. Where the flows occur in the real economy, they can have inflationary or deflationary consequences, particularly uh, I spend a lot of time monitoring where the real economy is. Does it have spare capacity or not? You then superimpose the effect of those flows to, to build your inflation forecasts. Um, so it is, I, I, I'd call it a flow of funds um, approach, which sort of gets lumped together with monetarism. Um, I, I sort of disagree with a lot of the monetarists, and I think they're just looking at one flow, whereas we should look at the, the system as a whole. Uh, the, the, there's even a bit of David Ricardo and um, general equilibrium theory thrown in there as well. So it's fairly eclectic, but it is a notion that systems would like to be in equilibrium, are trying to get to an equilibrium, but it's like that that mirage on the horizon. You never actually reach it. Yes. I would say equilibrium is sort of point you, you know, that it, it, theoretically it's wonderful, but you only ever really pass through it, going from one extreme to another, if you like. Yeah, um, and actually, by, or by the time you've got there, there's been a shock to the system and it's moved anyway. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I, you know, it seems particularly relevant when you're looking at Europe these days. That's right. Well, actually, it makes me it makes me prompts me to ask you that question. Of course, the market's obsessed with the idea of R star. Do you have, do you have a sort of view on whether you think that's a purposeful, worthwhile concept, or are we are we chasing our tails? I think we're chasing our tails. It's too static. A um, a, a, a concept. Um, real shocks are occurring all the time. Um, people's expectations for inflation are changing all the time. Um, so I I like the concept, but can't see how you can do it in practice. It's it's interesting you say that actually, because it reminds me, you, what you say reminds me of um, Dr. Soros's reflexivity theory, the idea that you know, as events change, they influence events or influence equilibriums, if you like. Yeah, um, yeah. And I mean, sort I, of feedback yeah. mechanisms, I suppose. Uh, yeah, I think I probably dropped off George's favourite list when I said that was just called simultaneous equations, but I, I, I was certainly <laughs> on board with that. <laughs> oh, you didn't like that one? You were never keen. Um, I no, I do like I do like the concept, and actually, I think. Um, it's worth rereading the alchemy of finance, where he introduces that at the moment. Uh, I mean, uh, that that book is essentially his trading notes from 1985, which was a pretty seminal year that defined the next 20, 30 years of investment style, and which I think is probably just reached its end. Um, that the, the, then the 2022, 2023 could be the the, the the, the polar opposite of 1985. So uh, and I'm a great believer in these sort of witness statements. So I think now actually I am rereading the alchemy of finance just coincidentally. Um, well, I have it on my shelf. I, I haven't dipped into it for probably way over 10 yeah, I think years. It, I think it's worth yeah. a flick through just yeah. it, it did sort of tell us where we were going probably much more than George realized. So interestingly, so actually, let, I mean, you know, we're not quite getting to the views, but you, you put in a wonderful throwaway comment there that the sort of era from 85 onwards has just changed. What do you mean by that? Um, uh, so the, 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 the big headline for my view at the moment is that we're moving from a world where we were demand constrained. So you, central banks thought they needed to provide a stimulus, that's low rates, that's asset price gains. We didn't have a lot of productivity growth or real value added, so we needed asset price gains. And in general, there was a desire to co collaborate, cooperate between countries as you were trying to generate enough demand for the common good. Um, central banks strayed from just controlling inflation because they didn't have to control inflation. They, they were into currency targets and suppressing volatility uh, and I think all that has changed since the pandemic and then we're now in a world that is supply constrained where we've got to compete for resources and if we're competing we're not cooperating um, yeah. and, I, and I, I think if we're looking at where do you want to invest in the next 10 or 15 years it's going to be finding in a world where there's a shortage of supply it's finding those countries and companies that can secure the supplies they need, can afford the supplies they need. So that's a strong terms of trade, 
that's productivity growth. Companies can control their costs. Countries can control their inflation through some form of credible medium term strategy, um, which is very much the opposite of, of where we've been for the last 25, 30 years, where it was just you know, chuck a lot of money at the system to try and generate demand. Um, and it sort of became yeah. There was a desire to cooperate to try and generate that demand, and I think now we're we're going to be, well, hopefully not fighting for resources in a in a, in a literal sense, but I think certainly competing for them. And what do you think's flipped it? You mentioned the pandemic is sort of the the timing. Do you think it's I, I, that or or other factors? I think it's a critical flipped? mass of things. The the pandemic has certainly had that effect, um, as indeed even the Japanese earthquake a decade ago probably started this when it um, real, when it showed the vulnerability of long supply chains. Um, climate change. Yeah, I, I'm, <laughs> yeah. I've been flying long enough, which I guess I've, unfortunately I've added my bit to climate change. But as you look out of the window on those long flights, you can see the world is changing. Um, I yeah. flew back over uh, the, the Arctic from, from the West Coast of the States a couple of weeks ago. And yeah, you, the, the world has definitely changed. Um, we are going to have to, certainly until technology moves on, consume less. Um, we've got geopolitics, it's a very different world. Uh, and I certainly think the world is moving into you know, a number of blocks. Um, that has costs. Defence spending isn't normally great for productivity in the short term, at least, uh, if we're doing more of that. So I think when we look at all of these factors, the world can probably produce less than it could in 2019. Certainly its growth rate is lower than it was prior to the pandemic. Um, in the UK, very significantly so. I think the UK can probably produce 4% less than it could in 2019, um, certainly at the moment. Uh, and that- That's a big number, 4% since- it, it, It's a horrible number. And, and, and yeah. from there you derive your recession forecast as to how much aggregate demand has to come down. So- Interesting. And do you get 4%, is that, because obviously people bandy the 4% post-Brexit as a sort of Brexit thing is. I, I'm sensing that's not what you're saying. You're saying pandemic is, is it labour supply? It, it, again, it, about it's a mixture of things that Brexit is, is one of them. Um, so the working population is down by a bit over a percent. People are working 1% fewer hours. Productivity is down compared to 2019. Now, I think some of that is recoverable. You know, we've had daft things like the new computer systems in the container terminals didn't work for two years um, and they are starting to work. So some of that productivity will, will come back and the shortage of truck drivers will ease. Um, but I think the, the, the bottom line for the UK is as of the last GDP print, we were trying to produce, or trying to consume 2% more than we did in 2019 and probably only able to sustain output of three or 4% less than we could in 2019. So yeah, um, so some challenges. So, so, so that, that I think is the, is the challenge. And the, the question was not, are we gonna have a recession? Is it gonna be led by monetary policy or fiscal policy was actually the question. Yes, and not, that not leads, the destination, but the route was the, uh, the, the, the subject of debate. No, in other words, the more you stimulate fiscally, the higher rates go, and yeah, or, or and, 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 vice and, and vice versa. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, interesting. So that leads that, that that makes me think of a couple of other questions because productivity is such a big issue, particularly in the UK, but globally, really. <laughs> I'm always conscious that uh, you know our, our multi-factor productivity, which is kind of really the core, the proper measure yeah. of productivity, which no one ever really talks about, but. Let's just, for, 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 for ease of understanding, it's not that dissimilar pattern to trend to labour productivity. But general productivity is sort of flatlined-ish for about a decade in the UK. Well, and, and that's not an unusual pattern around the world. I think we have one of the worst. We're, we're one of the worst. And the, the Jap Japan, unfortunately, is for them is worse. New, New Zealand, um, I think, actually is the bottom of the pile for that one, but we're certainly in the bottom third of the league table. Um, okay, so and well, how do you think these problems should be addressed? What, how should governments, and unless you can focus on the UK if you like, or broaden it out, but how, what sort of policies should be brought in to... Well, I think the first thing we need to do is to, is to re-educate um, policymakers that there is such a thing as a supply curve. Right. Uh, certainly in so many presentations that I've given in the public or conversations I've had in the public sector, 
there is just this assumption that the supply curve is elastic. It's just there and there's nothing they can do about it. And, and it's that, that kind of global supply years. chain idea. It's that global yeah. supply chain idea. You press the button, it comes from China type thing. Yeah. Um, and I think policymakers have just forgotten the supply the, the supply curve even exists, um, although they're having to, to, to learn that. Um, so I think, first of all, we just need a change in mindset that it's not only about aggregate demand, we have to think about the aggregate supply curve. And there's chasing the holy grail of productivity growth is, is always hard, but there is some low hanging fruit. Um, streamlining your regulatory environment. Uh, is it sensible the, U the UK corporate sector spends £25 billion a year on anti-money laundering when then when the money laundering would be a fraction of that amount if it were to occur? Um, perhaps we need to think about some of that. Yeah. Um, I, th I suspect you and I could talk for hours on the, the impact of the FCA and MIFID II and what that did to our productivity. Yeah, um, oh, yeah. let's not talk about that. Too, too upset. Let's, let's not go down that <laughs> road. Let's, let's do something not contentious, like perhaps we need to completely rethink education. Yeah. Uh, politically charged, and uh, get into conversations about the blob, et cetera, and all of that. But certainly, um, we do need to rethink education. Um, particularly, I would, I mean, a particular part of mine, and this is a, a sidebar, but 10% of the UK population is probably dyslexic. Right. Now, those people will struggle academically, but normally they're extremely innovative. Yeah. And we don't tap that resource. It's a good point, isn't it? Richard Branson's the famous dyslexic, yeah. isn't it? Um, yeah. so, so, I mean, uh, actually, I'm giving a presentation to a family office um, this evening. Uh, the proprietor of that family office is incredibly dyslexic. You know, everything has to be verbal, but it didn't stop him going from uh, nothing to being a multi-billionaire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very uh, true. So uh, more creative in the way you educate people and more yeah, I, understanding I, I, of the different talents, essentially. Uh, yeah, I think so. I, there's so much, we leave so much on the table in terms of human capital that we possess that we just don't use. Yeah. But let's, um, let, 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 let's just wind the question back a little bit, though, because, you know, it, you know, UK's productivity growth wasn't so bad up until really about 10 years ago, primarily, is when we really sort of started flatlining, if I, if I remember the data right. Yeah. What do you think kickstarted that flatline? Oh, I think getting overly, con um, overly focused on building houses. And there's not much productivity growth in putting one brick on top of another. Yes. Um, so that... Yeah, we have been doing that for a few thousand years. So you get too much focus on real estate. Construction tends not to be great for, for productivity. I think if I contrast the UK and the US, and this goes back to, in a sense, the sort of tangentially to the education thing. If you look at US growth, certainly up until the Trump presidency, it really only occurred in six or seven centres. The majority of US growth was just in say half a dozen cities. And every one of those cities, there was a really tight and collaborative relationship between tertiary education and the business sector. Right. So I've just come back from Seattle. Uh, Seattle's actually in a recession now, but in the last 12 years, the population there has trebled. Yeah. GDP has quadrupled. Yeah. And when I first was going to Seattle, the treasurer of the University of Washington, which is a big university in Seattle, um, had a billion dollar budget. Today, he has an eight billion dollar budget. Yeah. And that's sort of um, 10, 15 years or something type time. Frame. Yeah. Um, and that feeds Microsoft, that feeds Boeing, that feeds Amazon, who then reinvest. Um, if you want to go and sit in Pike, Pike Place, I think it's called, in the center of Seattle, the free municipal Wi Fi. Has a lot better, a lot better speed than I've got on Guernsey today. Yes. Um, the, the, so you the get those clusters. Self-reinforcing, yeah, growth cycle. And the UK has great universities. Um, yeah. And it's show, we've seen it around Oxford. We've seen it particularly around Cambridge. But why don't we extend that Cambridge corridor to the University of East Anglia? That's a great university, but it's not connected to the rest of the country. Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's not even a carriageway. Right? So in a sense, you would say a part of the problem is we we live in this sort of knowledge economy where um, you know it's all sort of more high tech and and also a lot of it's internet based and so on. So the more I think, you can I, I think a specific the problem, a specific problem in the UK is that I think so many of our policymakers, senior civil servants, have arts degrees, and we okay. could do with more science degrees. Interesting. In okay. Authority. What do you think about the financialization of the system, though? Because I always have the view that the, the part of the problem in, in the UK and other places is we're over financialized and that undermines our productivity growth. I don't think moving pieces of, yeah. Where you, I used to draw a chart actually, the size of the UK financial sector being, what, a fifth of GDP, give or take, depending on how you wanted to measure it. And then the net funds raised for the corporate sector being negative. Yeah. How could a fifth of your economy actually have a negative output? Yeah. Um, it did. It, you know, obviously, it produced income and that gave us spending. But what was it adding to the supply side of the economy? Um, that that mass kind of suggested very little. So, yes, that's a part. Um, but I, I suppose I think if you the brightest baby were heading for Canary Wharf or wherever they were going for. But then if the university they were attending had this great biotech or whatever it was attached to it, would they actually bother struggling into Canary Wharf and wondering what they were going to do once they were actually on that? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah there's the... so Part options. of it, I think, was it was the only thing, it was the only job in town. Yeah. Um, and we could create others. Um, it was like the idea all our best businesses end up in in, uh, in investment banks. Yeah, I, mean, I remember models. talking to, to Chris Patton, the Chancellor of the University of Oxford, over a dinner that we were both speaking at, and he'd run out of mathematicians. They'd all cleared off to work in the derivatives. Yeah. Um, yeah, that probably is not... Not, not ideal great for the economy in the longer term not ideal right let's get back on track because we've got <laughs> that was like a 15 minute diversion of uh of, of the main topic of what might break which is a fascinating diversion as well thank you i really appreciate it um we'll probably end up back there in half an hour's time because it's such an interesting subject uh and critical of course uh but the, but, but coming back to the original topic of the sort of podcast what might break um and uh, you know, I don't know if you want to start with a general overview or if you want to, I know you have some strong views on China that I'm keen to get into. Um, but the whole idea, the Fed's tightened a lot, everyone's tightening, QT, the system's tightening up. What do you think might bring? What are you worried about? I'm worried about the global credit system, um, which is still predominantly dollar based. Now, we had all of those stories that the demise of the dollar and the dollar was going to be weak. And actually, the dollar was soft for a, for, a, for a lot of that period. And the reason it was soft was because lots of people were borrowing dollars because they were cheap um, and using them to fund expenditure in their own locations, in their own countries. So they'd be selling the dollars to buy their local currency. And you had the appreciation of the emerging market currencies um, and, a, and a creation of a lot of dollar liabilities. The Federal Reserve was putting in dollars into the system. They had to go somewhere, and many of them were lent across borders, often in ways that statisticians didn't really see. You, know, you, you have these odd meetings in, in the course of your career, going to the Bank of France to be told that when they compiled the balance of payments data for France, they didn't bother including the repo liabilities of the French banks, which were about a trillion dollars, which is... Kind of a fairly large oversight, I, I, I would how, argue. How, how do they make it balance if they don't include it? Just had a balancing item. Right. That sounds like a classic. That's the problem with the balance of payments, isn't it? There's one massive unreconciled yeah. item. Yeah. And okay. then and we've got to think of the regulatory environment in the post GFC world banks were constrained with a lot of things they did on balance sheets. So if, if the big US banks wanted to lend to you, wanted to provide dollars to European banks, um, they do through things through cross currency basis swaps and market based derivative contracts, rather than just making a loan. Um, so, and this, it, the statisticians didn't keep up with that partly because we had austerity in, 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 in stat in government statistics. 
So we, we built a huge global credit system that's under-recorded, uh, I think systemically under-recorded. And at the same time, we created what I call refugee banks. So European and Japanese banks could make no money domestically in a world of zero domestic interest rates. So they had to reinvent themselves as global banks. And where was the positive return? It was in the dollar or it was in emerging market currencies where interest rates weren't zero. So we built this dramatic credit system that's sort of well and truly in the shadows. And then you have policymakers, particularly from 2016 onwards, wanting to fix currencies again. Obviously, the Europeans are big on their currency targets, but at the Shanghai Accord. And for China's banks, uh, the Shanghai Accord seemed like too good an opportunity to miss. Um, China's banks were running short of domestic funding by the middle of last decade. Um, China, China's economy actually accounts for 40% of all the bank deposits in the world. So the population has got more than enough deposits. They were trying to diversify into other things, crypto or whatever, overseas property. We've all, we've all seen those flows. And that was creating a funding problem for the Chinese banks. Uh, but they looked around. You've had the Shanghai Accord. You, in theory, haven't got any currency risk now with the dollar. US interest rates are near zero. PRC interest rates are 5%. What can go wrong in funding your mortgage lending in China or your lending to the Belt and Road Initiative? Um, funding all of that in dollars. Okay, uh, just let me stop you quickly there. Just, just for the purpose of, of listeners, remind, remind us all what the Shanghai Accord was and when it came into being and so on. So it's, it's, it's 2016 and it's a reaction to... The US is a bit worried about inflation. We've had the fall in the Chinese currency in 2015. Um, so the US and Chinese administrations got together and decided to have this sort of informal currency target for, for dollar RMB. Um, and that created, I think, a, a false sense of security uh, for, for people in China, that particularly Chinese property companies, but most of all Chinese banks, that they could fund cheaply in dollars nothing more than a carry trade in effect. Borrow cheaply in dollars, lend expensively in, in RMB at home. Yes. And, and then so, you, you, you have that big mortgage boom in, in China from 2016, really until the pandemic. And a, a very significant proportion of that is funded in dollars. Um, and you get Malaysia up to its old tricks, borrowing in dollars, the Thais, despite their rather checkered history, if you think back to the 1990s. Yeah. Um, Latin America, much less so. The um, political events there tended to discourage it. But the Asian economies, despite their experience in the 90s of having borrowed in dollars and then not been able to pay them back in 97, do exactly what they did then. Um, but they do it on a much bigger scale. And in fact, there's two big differences, I think, between the, the, the mid 90s in Asia and, and what we've just seen. One is just this question of scale. So Thailand was an insignificant part of the global economy in 97. China, obviously, is 15% of the global economy. Um, the, the numbers and the significance is much more. And then there's a more subtle feature, which is China's not the most transparent of countries when it comes to economic data and also it has some degree of capital controls and whether it was a fail just a simple failing by China's statisticians whether it was deliberately misleading or whether it was actually the banks and others finding ways around the regulations which meant they never reported how many dollars they were borrowing but I think the, 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 the perhaps the biggest difference between Asia in 97 and Asia today is in, in 97, you could prove how much they borrowed. The data was available. Um, now, maybe the Koreans have been a bit sparing with the truth. But in general, you could identify the problem. You knew the size of the problem. And of course, it was significant and it had pretty terrible implications. This time around, it's been very difficult to gain a true estimate of the size but we think, for example, that the Chinese banks at their peak had borrowed four trillion US dollars at the short end of the curve to fund RMB denominated lending 
long durations into pretty much in, now in, yeah, an illiquid insolvent property market. Um, right. They borrowed dollars to fund building a port facility in Sri Lanka, which probably doesn't have a lot of value now. Uh, and so you have huge credit risk, duration mismatch, currency mismatch. And the problem I think that we, we now face is Chinese rates have come down. US rates have gone up. Um, you'd like to unwind that trade. But of course, using RMB to repay dollar liabilities will push the Chinese currency down. Beijing doesn't want to see that. China just wants to see um, these debts repaid. But how can you repay these debts when you can't recover the assets? Uh, and so in the, the, it's a very long answer to, to your question of what might break. I think the dollar-based credit system in Asia is the Achilles heel in, in the global system. Um, Hong Kong looks horribly exposed to this um, in the, on a net basis, Hong Kong looks fine, but its gross exposure to China is about 10 times its GDP. And its foreign debt is 440,000 US dollars per working person in Hong Kong. You know, that's sort of Greece, that, that's yeah. Greece in 2015 times 15, I think, or times yeah. 20 possibly. Um, and it doesn't take much to go wrong in the mass for things to get very serious there. And of course, we've seen Hong Kong lose a quarter of its foreign exchange reserves in the last few months because it is caught in that. But I'd actually say it's not a vice squeezing Hong Kong. It's more China's going that way. The US is going that way. And Hong Kong's being stretched in the middle. Um, yeah. And that's so what I think we, that, that could break. That's fascinating because actually we must get on a bit more to the Hong Kong dollar because that's becoming increasingly a trade that people are, are talking about, a break of that peg. But just to go back to the to the China specific commercial bank and the China borrowing, um, you mentioned it's the statisticians aren't really measuring. How how do you find this then? How do you how do you get to the place of making that kind of estimate of the size of dollar borrowing uh, of four it, trillion or so? It, it, it was a pretty laborious task, and we we. And I had some some help with this, but we looked at it in three, almost four ways. The the first one was just to look at the IMF BIS data, which, to be honest, was not a lot of use. Right. Uh, the second way was to find a Chinese language speaker or a couple of Chinese language speakers who were prepared to go through the notes to the accounts of the 36 largest banks in China um, and aggregate what they were showing for foreign liabilities. Right, so the um, Chinese banks themselves do report. They, they do report this. Um, so yeah. whereas China, whereas the PBOC was talking about $200 billion of foreign liabilities in the entire banking system, the Bank of China's annual report showed they had over a trillion. Right. <laughs> um, well, how, does that, how does that compute? How is it that PBOC ends up with that sort of number? When I mean, I understand yeah. also there's some mismatch between uh, there's some disbelief in markets about the actual level of PBOC dollar reserves themselves. A lot of a lot of the PBOC foreign reserves are actually assets held in Belt and in the Belt and Road Initiative. Right, and so they're loans they've made out to other yeah. people, uh, right. and some of their foreign reserves are actually dollar-denominated debt of domestic financials, which I don't think really counts as a foreign reserve. Um, okay. So that sort of, is it three trillion now, or that sort of number? It's is... sort of three and a quarter trillion, but in, in liquid, it's probably about a third of that. So that's, yeah. that, does that not lead you to that? Well, I presume all of this leads you to the idea that the, the Renminbi is eventually going to... Uh, but actually, before we get to that, finish, finish what you're saying. Sorry. So you go through all the Chinese commercial bank yeah. accounts. Yeah, so, so, so you can do that. And I must confess, I outsource that to, to, to somebody much, much better at it. My... My two contributions were to survey the lenders to right. try and find out the West's exposure. Uh, and particularly you mean you actually, you, you, you sent them questionnaires, you rang them up and talked to them? Yeah, you, you, you bought a few coffees. Um, right. And the exposure amongst the Japanese and European banks, and actually the Bank of Japan, Ministry of Finance in Japan were very, very helpful, probably unwittingly in, in helping us get some of this. And then the, the the slightly creative one was to try and reconcile China's balance of payments with the rest of the world uh, right. and find that there was a four trillion dollar unexplained gap. Um, and you could, could have, only you have, be 
uh, only be a liability that they'd missed. And I, I think to be fair to China, that's a lot of the issue occurred around the foreign direct investment account and countries I mean, from the US in the late 90s, countries often have a lot of wiggle room with what they call foreign direct investment and what they call borrowing. Um, yeah. And that's where a lot of this stuff had come in. So you'd see that in China had eight times as much foreign direct investment from Hong Kong as Hong Kong had provided, but Hong Kong's loans to China made up all of the difference. Right. Okay. So though they, they played around with the classifications, but essentially when we did those three or four exercises, uh, with the exception of using the, the, the headline official data, everything came out in the three and a half trillion dollar plus or minus postcode. Okay, so there's three or four ways of confirming and, that kind yeah. of number. Uh, and, and then the, the, the final thing was you looked at when were the refinancing period, when was this likely to be stressed from refinancing and things like December 2018 and September 2019, which of course we saw a lot of pressure on dollar funding markets. Um, went, oh went yes, just, that was the repo blow up, was it September yeah. 19? Yeah. That, that I think had a very significant, well, I think China had a very significant role in that. So you had some circumstantial evidence, you had some data, um, and so by the middle of 2020, we were pretty confident that we, we'd we identified this $4 trillion hole. You then could add a bit for Korea, uh, say some of the ASEAN economies got a bit overexcited in this as well. Um, so we always thought there was going to be a fragility. And sure enough, as the Fed has raised interest rates, we've seen the Asian currencies weaken. We've seen the foreign exchange reserves come under a lot of pressure. Now, fortunately, the Asian governments haven't tried to tough it out in the way they did in 97 and started raising interest rates aggressively and crashing their economies. Well, most of them haven't. Um, and so it was a it was a financial event which had some great investment potential as far as we were concerned, but it wasn't the, the, the kind of crisis. Now, there's time has moved on, and I think really in the last few days, in that if you now superimpose China having a balance of payments constraint, in that if they print too many RMB, a lot of those cheap RMB will be used to repay their dollar liabilities. So the RMB could follow the, you know, do what the Thai Bart did in, in 97, which clearly Beijing wouldn't want. That is a, a very binding constraint on China's ability to offset any economic slowdown. You then throw into that zero COVID and, and the other things that are going on in China, and you actually see that China's ability to provide a, a policy offset to the COVID problem is, is deeply compromised. Um, that we are going to therefore get discontinuities in supply, which could be inflationary for particular sectors, and we would hear about iPhone shortages or whatever, maybe that occurs. But the discontinuities that worry me the most is we're going to, I think we're going to see a lot of income discontinuities that a household that's locked in their apartment isn't going to pay the mortgage. And that's right. going to feed through into the bank. Companies aren't going to pay their suppliers. Um, if we're, some of the other work we've done suggests about a third of the apartments sold by Chinese developers since 2016 haven't been built yet. Um, that's an open invitation, surely, to, to people just yeah defaulting um so i think we're going to see a lot of inter lot, lot more internal credit events and remember china is the most indebted economy on the planet private debt so, is probably three times gdp yeah so so just to, to, so to get back to the sort of the, the sort of now and then triggers so this this story's been building as you say since 2016 large dollar liabilities in the chinese banking system and, and money's now tightening up and so the commercial banks in China are tightening up at a time when you, when zero COVID is is still an issue, is what I what uh, and when the corporate says. sector in particular needs more credit to, to make up for the for, for the lack of income because people are locked out of the shopping centres or whatever. Yes, yeah, so you've got you two big the, two big forces hitting two at big the same forces time. colliding now in the US. Emergency credit to the corporate sector was, uh, I think, about the equivalent of 40% of US GDP. It was a bit less in the UK, it was a bit less in Europe, but these are you know, 20, 30% credit impulses to offset your lockdown. China's not capable of doing that because of their balance of payments constraint.
So what do you make though of the idea that if you look at the monthly lending numbers in China, they've been they've been picking up quite nicely in, in recent months? Um <clears throat> I don't think they've actually picked up very much. Um is the first one. We're still looking at credit growth. So running at about the low teens as a percentage of GDP. And historically, the Chinese corporate sector, which includes local governments, um, probably needs to borrow about 19% of GDP just to run its normal level of operations, throwing COVID disruptions on that. And I think Chinese credit growth would need to be twice what it is today to provide any sort of meaningful offset to what we're seeing. Right. So we're seeing capital spending falling away, particularly badly in the property market, import growth destroyed, which of course has implications for, for, for China's trading partners. And the other factor, of course, is the, the Chinese corporate sector is trying to export anything that isn't nailed down. Um, so we're heading for a trillion dollar trade surplus. And this is incredibly deflationary for the world. China is, China's export prices are now falling sharply in dollar terms as they're basically dumping goods to raise dollars to repay these foreign liabilities. And this is the uh, running a current account surplus to repay external liabilities is about the most deflationary thing a country yeah. can do. Yeah. And if it's the world's second largest country, then that explains why US goods price inflation has just sort of rolled over. We've got a buildup of inventories across Asia. Uh, and I, so I, th I do think this has global implications, particularly for inflation and in the medium term for growth. If China has been such a big part of global growth since the global financial crisis, China in, you know, I have no doubt they're never going to admit to being in a recession officially, but China in a lockdown style recession is a huge drag for, for the global economy, for commodity markets, for its trading partners. So interesting. So you don't see any. So so a lot of chat in markets at the moment that we're going to get a, a, a reopening trade out of China, whether it's a sort of spring post the the, the, the difficult winter weather, and then China fully reopens. And 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 the argument in markets is sti some stimulus sitting there that that generates that reopening. And we had every post COVID in the West every time you reopen, you've got a, a, a sort of bounce as people are released to spend money. Do you do you see that, or you just think it's going to fade? If it happens and it's a it's a sort of it's a sort of site it's a bit of a note to the whole big i think story. i think it's a footnote in that we had a little bit of a reopening and it didn't materially improve capacity utilization and now we're locking down again um i think the much more binding constraint um is is this credit constraint that china is facing so since Deng Xiaoping's great leap forward in the mid 80s, say on average, the Chinese corporate and local government sectors have borrowed the equivalent of 19% of GDP. That's why China is such an indebted economy. Yeah, um, it, it relies on the soft budget constraint and they ran out of funding for that in 2015, 2016, turned to external sources. And this is such a carbon copy of what Thailand and the others had, had done in the, in, in the 1990s that I think Unwinding those foreign liabilities, now, even with a trillion dollar current account surplus, it's going to take them three or four years um, to work their way through this. Now, I started covering China in the late 80s. <clears throat> I, I was kind of around for the, the inflation and the, and the big Chinese recession in 94. And China, I think very sensibly, then took a five year time out to clean up the mess. Uh, and in an investment sense, I always remember that everybody wanted to be maximum bullish on China in 1993, just as it crashed. Yeah. And by 2000, 2001, particularly when I was starting the company, actually, I, one of my big themes in 2001 when I, when I launched Andrew Hunt Economics was China is actually coming back. You've got WTO membership, the credit cycle was turning. I think it took me two years to get anybody interested in China. They, they've forgotten yeah. it in the previous five years. Yeah. I think I think we could see China taking a what I would call a time out, yeah. um, which is a big change in global circumstances, particularly places like Australia, New Zealand, where I think the population has this sort of expectation of rising prosperity into, into yeah. infinity in the basis of Chinese import demand. And, and I think that's yeah. going to take a five year. OK, so you think China takes five, year, five years out. Where, where does that leave? Do you have any view on the geopolitics? There's obviously a lot of chat about 
Oh, wow. uh, is that I'm, used as a I, I, I talk or? around positively, uh, and I do. You know, part of the Chinese bank's inability to borrow dollars has been encouraged by the U.S. regulators, possibly even by the State Department. So geopolitics have played a role in this, but it's left China needing dollars. For all the talk about the demise of the dollar and the rise of the RMB, at the moment China is very short dollars. We mentioned the shortage of dollars earlier. Yeah. Now, that appears in Europe because of the European banks were the intermediaries for a lot of this. Um, but with China ultimately needing dollars, they need a current account surplus. They can't yeah. afford to be on the receiving end of trade sanctions. So I think that does prevent them um, from, from doing anything silly around Taiwan. And it will also explain why um, Beijing is quite keen that Mr. Putin... Lights things yeah. down because quite, China's quite not in a global yeah. trade slump. Interesting. So, so you mentioned that European banks are one of the intermediaries. So we talk about the euro dollar system, and, and where do you see the signs of stress, or where would you expect to see them? It. I mean, I think we are seeing it in the European banks' foreign liabilities. Um, no, the, we're seeing it in Japan. Um, and actually, the, the Bank of Japan has been quite transparent about the problems that the Japanese banks are facing. And I think it was the shortage of dollars in the Japanese banks is such a big part of the weak yen story over the last year. Um, Europe's being a little more opaque about it, um, deliberately or otherwise, I'm not sure. But we're, obviously, we've seen the Swiss National Bank have to use swap lines to, yeah. to pop up parts of its system. Um, I think probably some of the French and Dutch banks uh, are caught up in this as well. Um, one would assume the German banks are, although I must confess I haven't found any of their footprints when I've looked for them. Yeah. Um, so, and the other so place I think good. it might show up is, uh, the other two places, it's sort of related, private credit, because a lot of these are sort of off-market, peer-to-peer type stuff uh, that the Chinese banks sort of, I came across one family office that was holding a $300 million three-month CD, courtesy of a Chinese bank. Um, whether that gets repaid remains to be seen. And some of the asset management companies, a lot of asset managers, and I think here maybe the, this is about the only bit of the US financial system that's directly exposed, have used Chinese dollar-denominated commercial paper to get a yield. And also the crypto Things like te Tether seems to be all over Chinese commercial paper as well. Uh, and so defaults in that could reverberate around the system. Now, if a, if a bank has a so, go bad, they've got so capital. Yeah, so you're saying crypto could feed into this Chinese um, dollar borrowing issue and tighten it up. So, so, um, so it, this it, is the um, potential yes, link um, everyone's been looking for. I think it. I think it could go both ways. In the problems in crypto, make it harder for Chinese banks to get dollars out of the, the, the people like Tether, but also stuff going bad in China undermines the reserves of these stablecoin things. Yeah. Um, so the, 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 there's not a lot of good good news on that nexus. Have um, you been following a bank called Silver Lake Bank? Not. It's, it's, do you know? Do you know the one I mean? It's everyone's chatting about it. It's a it's a bank that it's a regulated bank, FDI, Fed regulated yeah. bank that links the crypto world to the commercial banking yeah. system. Um, yeah, I I've sort of followed it a bit. Um, I have been more focused on the Japanese banks who may have a trillion dollars of exposure. Oh, much bigger, I know, I know. Yeah. I was just um, curious if you'd been keeping an eye on it. And the European yeah. banks are probably a bit more of that. And I think they're probably more, they're the ones that I think could generate a policy response from the West. Uh, in terms of something breaking that the Fed would be interested in in the short term, I would have thought it was more likely an asset manager that's... Uh, augmented their uh, their cash management product with some some dodgy Chinese paper that they then haven't got the capital to absorb the losses on. But in the near term, I would have thought the Federal Reserve and some other some of the other major central banks are going to be quite happy about this. You're just about to get a wave of cheap imports from China, which has a 
entirely beneficial yeah. effect on your it's a kind of perverse version of goldilocks if you like you you can yeah. import chinese deflation to offset your own service sector inflation yeah interesting and so 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 in terms of the the response of the central banks what you're saying is until until they feel that the inflation is 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 under control properly whatever that means they're, they're not going to respond too hard to something breaking unless it really is very, very central to their... To I, I their think so. And that, that could be a little uncomfortable for equities in the near term. We've got a lot of bond issuance um, waiting in the wings. Um, as, as we saw yesterday, Powell is not backing off with the rhetoric on inflation, even if he's perhaps looking at doing... Yeah, short term rates rising rising slow and I think we're actually moving to more quantitative tightening and less price tightening um, which probably is quite bad news for the long end of the curve at least in the near term um, so the Fed not responding to what's going on in China in, but inflation coming down maybe some supply pressure on bond yields in the near term that could give us higher real yields which isn't traditionally the, the greatest backdrop for the equity market in the near term yeah, so higher real yields on issuance, basically. It's, yeah, it's, yeah. Um, no, I mean, we, I mean, I've been sort of doing some maths, and we came to the, the number. You got about six hundred and fifty, maybe eight hundred billion dollars of treasury supply between now and the thirty first of December, having had True. very little supply for the last few weeks well, and in a month, few years. In a month, you've got a, a net eight hundred billion. Or, or, yeah. Or, right. Wow. So they're back ended. Is that the point? That they've back ended that, um, and also we've got a rise in the Treasury General account penciled in, which tends to suck liquidity out of the banks. Um, the banks also are struggling a bit for liquidity because so much money ends up in the money market mutual funds in a rising rate environment. So yeah. I think we could see some market pressure on yields. The Fed is still delivering a fairly hawkish rhetoric, uh, and we've got a lot of Chinese paper to um, refinance and a market that doesn't want to accept it. So. In the near this term, is, is, I think there's a China, risk of a steeper curve. It, sorry, this is China, Chinese dollar denominated paper. It needs yeah. To be, right. And this links to that four trillion, presumably. Uh, yeah. So a lot. I, we tend to see a lot of refinancing in September and December. Interesting. OK. And then just finally on the Hong Kong dollar before we before we get a broader markets, uh, which you've already touched on. But in terms of the Hong Kong dollar, you, is that a trade you've just been interested in recently or is that i mean obviously breaking the peg seems to me is i've heard that story every year for for many years now probably since um, john invented it yeah <laughs> <laughs> and of course i mean i mean in, in some ways it's a very political decision more than an economic decision obviously economic pressure adds to it but it, oh. it strikes me that it's really at its heart it's a xi jinping call not not only because uh, my first job i was hired by um, a gentleman who'd given John Greenwood, the inventor of the Hong Kong dollar, peg his first job. So I think I was sort of indoctrinated with the Hong Kong dollar from, from day one. But up until 2000, I was a 100% supporter of the peg. I wasn't necessarily a supporter of the HKMA, who took John, John Greenwood's very simple system for running the Hong Kong dollar and made it complicated. But the concept I liked. But the day when John and, and others put the peg together really only in about two weeks. Um, it was an incredible effort. Hong Kong, 30% of the economy was manufacturing. They were buying raw materials in dollars and selling toys in dollars. Um, yeah, so it made a lot of sense. It made a lot of sense. I'm not sure it makes a lot of sense in a world of seemingly infinite quantitative easing, where the Fed was spitting out dollars and the Japanese banks were desperate to borrow those dollars and lend them in to into China via Hong Kong. So Hong Kong ended up with a debt ratio that's four times, a domestic debt ratio that's four times what it was in 97, because it picked up some of those dollars on the way through. So this is an incredibly indebted economy. Its gross exposure to China, say, is more than 10 times its GDP. Its foreign liabilities are 12 times its GDP. These are all outsized. And I think it's because you had a very large China with an insatiable demand for dollars on one side and the US spitting out incredible amounts of dollars on the other. And it went through this very narrow great way that was Hong Kong. But the biggest change I think is in the population in Hong Kong. Um, lucky enough still to have some, some Hong Kong clients. And I did a survey on, on one of the bigger investment meetings 
as to who was over the age of 15, who in the room was over the age of 15 when the Hong Kong peg was introduced and knew why the peg was introduced and where Hong Kong was in 1994 and that it was on the board, it was on the cusp of hyperinflation. Were two people out of 30. Yeah. I think the pop, I think the collective memory in Hong Kong as to why the peg was there in the first place um, has been lost. And therefore, the justification for rising real yields, collapsing property prices. I mean, let's say that China, 20% of Hong Kong's exposure to China goes bad. Hong Kong would need a current account surplus approaching 100% of its GDP to make good on its foreign liabilities. Now, A, that's mathematically impossible, but yeah. the domestic economy would just have to stop. And I can't see anybody in Hong Kong accepting that, particularly after what's already been a multi-year recession. So I don't think the HKMA can actually defend the Hong Kong dollar if this thing goes goes properly pear-shaped, to use a technical phrase. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think the Hong Kong dollar is is in play, um, and whether China has the dollars to help defend it, it, I think we've already touched on. They probably don't. Um, yeah, and I suppose also it's, it's actually a very cheap trade to play, isn't it? It costs it's pretty cheap, much nothing. Yeah. yeah. That, uh, uh, and if you want to get geopolitical about it, a lot of China's debt is through Hong Kong. China doesn't have to default; it gets Hong Kong to default. So you mean so you mean a bit like um, a bit like a sort of uh, ERM trade? There's the, there's an argument that uh, enough speculators may come in to force the PBOC's hand, who uh, who we, as you said don't really have that many dollars with which to defend Hong Kong's peg, or Hong yeah. Kong themselves don't have many dollars. Is no, that, that uh, the suggestion? I think that there's a, I think that that's true. That if if we're right about the amount of liquid reserves that China has, we know how many reserves Hong Kong has already expended trying to defend the peg. Uh, they, they they will run out of money in the event of a proper default cycle um, emanating out of the Chinese property sector, out of the Chinese corporate sector in general. So, yes, it, I think the, if the Hong Kong dollar is ever going to go, it certainly could go. And history isn't really on its side. It's very hard to find a city state that was returned to the motherland that kept its currency more than a generation. Yeah, yeah, I understand that. So in other words, we could be we could be facing an example where the speculators and, and, and capitalism actually force the hand of the autocrats and communism. It, it's possible. It, sounds it, may, it may not even involve the speculators. It may just simply be that the, the, the Japanese and European banks that have lent those dollars to Hong Kong demand their money back. And it just isn't there. Interesting. So a run on, a run on the bank, so to speak. Um, a, run on the, yeah, a run on the funding of the mid-sized Hong Kong banks is, is certainly not impossible. Interesting. So tell me, um, just let's just quickly touch on on, on global markets before uh, before we before we have to wrap up. So so what might break? We, you talked a lot about that 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 credit dollar credit system, particularly in Asia and China, and the links with Japan and, and, and European banking systems, which is utterly fascinating and, re and really interesting. Um, where where do you advise clients to asset allocate? So if they're thinking. Six months plus, or 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 you pick your time frame. But what's your advice on where their money should be at the moment? So look, I, mean, I think all roads lead back to bonds in, in this world of correlated markets that we we seem to be in at the moment, at least. And near term, I am worried about supply pressure. So perhaps the bond markets are, have rallied a bit too far um, as a, a, a sort of a trading view for the next few months, just we, we've got some supply. But I think in six months time, this is such a deflationary event that's occurring in China, Asia, and in this financial system that yields at the long end of the curve can be lower than where they are today. And that we'll be in a global recession at that point. China in its worst recession, certainly since 94, and perhaps in its worst ever recession. The UK, we touched on earlier, that could be quite a vicious recession. Europe, certainly recession bound. The US, I'm only looking for about a half percent decline in GDP, I think. Uh, and that you can sort of see that's beginning to become a possibility. Certainly the northwest of the US looks a lot weaker than it did a couple of months ago. And I, I think it'll spread across the, the country as the tech sector weakness spreads. So global recession mid-year, bonds rally, 
equities are probably vulnerable in the very near term if we have a rise in yields as the world is weakening. Um, and then they just have to digest the, the, the outlook for earnings, et cetera. It's probably not a great environment for equities, but at least you get lower bond yields. So I'm not, you know, if we're going to have an event in the equity markets, I think it's in the near term. And then we just sort of start pricing in a recession, which doesn't involve too many fireworks. Yeah. At, some, at some point, I would guess in about nine months time, policymakers will see inflation having come down. They're in a recession. They'll be conscious that most of their populations, particularly their voting populations, haven't exactly had the best three years. Uh, and we move towards a policy easing, probably fiscal policy, central banks taking their foot off the brake, if not actually easing. And then I think the big call that we have to get right this time next year is what's going to happen to wages. I had a fascinating meeting with the uh, an academic economist who worked in reserve uh, in a central bank um, about wage expectations, wage inflation, etc. And, and his work, which I I haven't done anything like the detail he has, but I've come to similar conclusions that three quarters of somebody's wage demand is backward looking, right? And about fifteen percent is what can I get away with today, and a kind of nebulous ten percent on what do I think. The world will be like in a couple of years time i certainly don't believe that in 1976 uk or us workers could correctly predicted that inflation would be in high in 1979 and asked for a pay rise before i think yeah. they were looking backwards and saying our wages went down in 73 our wages went down in 74 75 wasn't great but hey the central banks are easing there's a policy easing risk on is in markets and so i'm going to be a bit risk on i'm going to put my hand up for a pay rise right i spoke to a manu uk manufacturer recently um who were pleased to tell me that they just got their output back to 2019 levels uh, but their profits were down by two-thirds so after i disgraced myself by saying that was an interesting form of communism um yeah. maybe they should try making some money by producing less and they said well we don't think the customer base it's fair to do it to them right now or generate some ill will etc other side of the recession we're going to put our prices up 20 percent get right. those numbers back and so, so my those fear, factors, you're, my you're fear saying, is yeah. that when policymakers ease in response to the recession towards the end of next year the nominal recovery is inflation, not real growth. And that would be kryptonite to debt markets. Yeah. Because in the 70s, that's what killed the bond, the bond investors. Bond markets looked through 73 into the recession of 74. Yields hardly went up in the oil shock. And I think US rates went from four and a half to six or something, that sort of order of magnitude, and then down again in the recession. Then, of course, yields went to 10 yeah. or 12. So this is so this is consistent with that sort of whole Kondratiev idea that we're now in the in the 20, 30 year upswing in yields. And and it's also and basically it's consistent with what you said at the start. We're in a supply constrained world, not a not a demand constrained. Yeah. And, it's and a I very think, different environment. Yeah, I think 23 is the outlier. Like we had in that long disinflation or deflationary environment from really the Asian financial crisis, or really the mid-90s until 2020. You did have years where you worried about inflation. I think 23 is the year where you worry about deflation and an otherwise inflationary trade. Yeah, I'm with you. You get, do you get, you get recessionary infl deflationary shocks and then, uh, and then you get policymakers stepping back in and, and kickstarting the, the, the inflationary challenges in that supply constraint world. Uh, and, we're, and, we're, and, if, and if that's right, that 24, 25 has got a wage price spiral, we're not going to get away with calling it transitory. We're going to have to call it persistent. So we're, so really, the big, very big picture is we're doing what um, we've started in the last 12 months, which was we're moving from a world where capital is favoured to a world where labour is favoured effectively. Um. Or if you like, you're, you're, you're uh, normalizing rates and deflating a lot of asset prices and uh, yeah, and part I, of that. And I think your investment strategy goes from chasing asset price, you know, capital appreciation, as it were. You're going from chasing rising property prices and financial engineering 
to a world where you've got to invest in people with productivity, with value added, countries that can control inflation. And I'm, I'm going to go, actually, you know, I'm not sure John Greenwood's talking to me at the moment after my comments on the Hong Kong dollar. He probably won't be if he hears this, but his, I think arguably his bigger contribution to, to financial markets was correct, correctly identifying in the mid 70s that Japan was going to control inflation, could afford commodities. And if you think of the UK, US stock markets in the 70s were basically flat in real terms. Yeah. They went up a bit, they went down a bit, but they were pretty unhappy. Um, I seem to remember the, the the GT Japan fund, I think returned something like a thousand percent in, in yeah. sterling terms. Yeah. So if you if you find the countries that and companies that react to this new supply constrained world, that's where I think you can generate an awful lot of alpha. Whereas the indices, um, the stock market indices that we have, are stuffed full of companies that, by definition, were successful in the last twenty five years. Now some of those might be able to evolve, um, but it's a very different business environment to the one that took yes. them to being such large parts of an index. Interesting. So it really sort of fits the idea that markets have, have secular cycles. Um, the idea that you, you you know where you did well for the last five, 10 years probably isn't where you're going to, where you're going to do well in the next five or 10. Um, but... it, 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 if we're reinventing a, a vertical supply curve or a, or a steeply sloped, sloped supply curve, that that is a 180 degree change to, to the world that, you know, even probably, dare I say, even you and I have really inhabited, let alone people that are, are rather more youthful than us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's been a, yeah, it's been, in a sense, there's been a lot of one-way trades, but um, certainly in the bond market until recently. Um, but that's fantastic. So, so what, what's, what is, what is, what is front and centre of your mind? Just leave us with, with one final thought. What's, um, uh, what is it that you're most focused on at the moment, most interested in? In a short-term sense, it's where the, yeah, I, I'm convinced that China's economy is going to suffer its worst recession, that that's disinflationary, deflationary. And I think the, cre the key question for investors in the next few months, certainly, is whether the bond markets can reflect that by giving us lower yields to compensate for the fact that global growth is slowing. Or do the internal supply and demand dynamics uh, mean that yields actually climb into a slowdown, which would be quite dangerous for equities? I, I'm much, uh, I'm so forgiving, but I'm much more understanding of what happened to, to the trust administration. I think gilts were, were due that flash crash anyway, just because of the change in the issuance calendar or yeah. the issuance amounts that was coming out. I think the, the press rather exaggerated, suggested yes. level of confidence. I'd agree with you. So actually, in a way, the bond, the bond vigilantes are back is the point, in a sense. Yeah, I, 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 and... If the issuance calendar is to be believed, they could well be in the US between now and the end of the year, and January to mid-February is where they could appear in Europe. And if that coincides with the Chinese economy rolling over into really something quite unpleasant, that's higher real yields. Fantastic. Well, that's fantastic. So much food for thought, Andrew. I really appreciate your time. It's been a fascinating no, conversation. Good. Very interesting. And uh yeah, hopefully one day we'll get you back and we'll, 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 we'll watch how this plays out. Well, the next see, yeah, we, we'll see if we can buck the global trend and keep up with collaboration rather than the competition. <laughs> how about that? Fantastic. Thank you. Really appreciate your time. Take care.